What's up everybody, Rabbit Hedgehog here, and what do you know, what's in front of me? The FTR 1200S race replica. This is a 2019 motorcycle, all in stock formation, which is what exactly I wanna look for whenever we're doing these reviews, and that way we can get you the best possible out of the box review that we possibly can do. So you're like, oh, so you got yourself a new motorcycle. The answer to that is no. This is actually a great gesture by Indian of Oklahoma City. I want to thank them for allowing me to take this bike out for an entire week so that way I can give you guys, the subscribers and viewers, the best possible review that I can by using this bike every day like it was my own machine. This was actually a used motorcycle. It had about 1,800 miles on it when I first received it, and that was really added to during this time because I put some good miles on it so that way I could give you guys the best perspective that I possibly can. And granted, I know Oklahoma roads aren't the best. I know we don't have the most twisty or the most mountains or the most hills or anything fun to ride on. I did my best of what I could do with what I have around me. So there's gonna be some hills, there's gonna be some turns, there's gonna be some things that I normally don't get to do whenever I'm doing just the small, typical rides. And I very much am appreciative to Indian of Oklahoma City for allowing that to happen. I also want to thank AGV Sport USA for providing us the gear to keep us safe. You'll see my Polymar jacket hanging there. Uh, you'll see various other uh, gear from them throughout this video. And also Law Tigers for being an awesome supporter of this channel and also the motorcycle community as a whole uh, throughout the United States. Thank them once again for joining us and allowing us to make this great content for you guys. So without further ado, let's get out there and let's talk about this wonderful motorcycle that is in front of me right now. So this is going to be a little bit different review than what I normally do. It's going to have both voiceover and live on the back of the bike reaction. So let's get to it. Let's talk about the specifications of the FTR 1200S. This is going to be a 2019 model, but it is unchanged for 2020. It is powered by a 73 cubic inch 1203 cc v-twin engine that is liquid cooled with a claimed 123 horsepower and 87 foot pounds of torque six speed transmission that has an assist and slipper clutch on it the race editions do have the Akrapovic exhaust so a little bit different power ratings than the other brothers and sisters in the range the front braking system is Brembo 320 millimeter dual discs. And then you do have the 5.9 inches of suspension travel, both front and rear on fully adjustable 43 millimeter fork and single uh, shock in the rear. Walking around and the other dimensions are as follow. Your fuel capacity is 3.4 gallons with a ground clearance of 7.2 inches. Overall height of the motorcycle, 51.1 inches. Length is 90 inches. Width is 33.5 with a rake and trail of 26.3 degrees at 5.1 inches. Lean angles are 43 degrees. The weight of the machine fully ready to ride is 518 pounds and the wheelbase is 60 inches. It runs on Dunlop DT3R radials with cast 19 inch front wheel and a cast 18 inch rear wheel. The systems on board are a tilt sensitive ABS and traction control system that does allow for greater safety on this particular motorcycle. And it does come with the 4.3 inch ride command LCD touchscreen with Bluetooth capability and USB quick charger on the bottom. Whenever it starts up, it does go through a complete sequence of checking itself out. And it gives you a little Indian FTR uh, flash screen as it goes through its cycling. Once it is loaded up, you'll get a command to touch to clear the warning, and then you will get the gauges to load up. You do have two sets of gauges on this particular machine. They can be changed fairly easily by either swiping or changing in the menu system, and you'll see that I'm swiping there. You can also tap on the odometer there, and you can see you get your regular and two trip odometers. You can do this on both screens, wherever the odometer is. You can go ahead and tap that, and that way you can adjust your odometers and see how far you've rode. On the screen, it does have those redundant buttons as well where you don't have to use touch. You can tap on it and bring up that information. You can see you can go back and forth real easily with those controls. It also has two other controls on the handlebars as well that allows you to access everything. Through the settings menu, you can change your themes, add your Bluetooth devices, check your diagnostics, check out your bike's information such as the VIN number, how much oil life is left and all that good stuff. You can see that there's the redundancy on the left side that you can access the menu system and control it with the joystick and select button that is there. You can see that you can add a Bluetooth device for phone and music and all that good stuff and also add your communicator so it all seamlessly goes through the ride command system. 
You can enable track mode and also turn off the traction control and ABS system on this machine. And then you can leave it in track mode if you want to, but you can keep the traction control and ABS systems on. You do have rain, standard, and sport mode on throttle responses. Does not change the power output, just changes how the throttle moves. Back over to the right side, you have the engine cutoff switch, and you have that last control as stated that is basically the forward control on where to adjust your information. On this side, you have your flash to pass and also your bright selection. You do have your cruise control, which is push in, push down for set, push up for go faster. There's your turn signals and hazard and horn. All right, so here we are day one, picking it up from Indian of Oklahoma City. And what would you know, put it immediately to use as a utility motorcycle. You'll see that I'm carrying a seat for an Indian Chieftain on the back of it. Uh, the FTR does have two grab handles on the back, so you can see we have some little ratchet straps there holding that seat in place. But you can see then you can actually use it for utilitarian purposes. Most people don't test that kind of idea on the motorcycle. So let's go ahead and let's uh, get on the bike and let's get some reaction from day one. Now the cool thing about the FTR is just the amazing amount of power it has. Now, of course, I am in sport mode, which is the absolute uh, top end, and I'm also in track mode. So I'm basically giving this bike everything it's got. Oh, man, these brakes bite, bite so, so hard. Kind of, kind of have to remember how to get used to this bad boy once again because it is quick and it is potent. Quite the machine. Now there is no quick shift wizardry or anything like that on the FTR. The FTR is just basically bare bones motorcycling with some extras added to it, such as the cruise control, the track modes and stuff like that. That's all in there. But in reality, it doesn't really change the actual power itself. It more or less changes throttle responses. <laughs> and you can see this thing's got throttle response already getting up to well needed speed for the area in only second gear without issue whatsoever. The bike wants to fly. Like I remember the last time. <laughs> Now, last time I only got to take this bike out for about 20 minute ride and you know, it is what it is when it comes to riding a motorcycle, you do have to kinda take what you can, but I'm very thankful that I get to take this bike out for a long ride today. And that is going to be amazing. And the engine braking on this bike is phenomenal, but those front Brembo brakes are just absolutely phenomenal. Now this bike is kind of, kind of an ADV bike, but it's more an ADV bike for the street. It is not really designed to be a full off-road machine. However, it does have things in its advantage. It does have the flat track style tires on it. So if you're on a dirt road, that's a nice improved dirt road. It's not a bad place to be at on an FTR. It doesn't have belt drive like its brothers and sisters in the lineup, which that is an amazing thing. You do not want belt drive on off-road because let's face it, if you get a rock in that pulley and you puncture the belt, you just ruined a belt. So you can't do that with a chain drive bike like this one and that's why I'm okay with it being a chain drive of course I know that people are like well why can't it be shaft drive well that's weight and some other things and that's up to the manufacturer to figure out how to conquer the dirt either by chain or by the shaft drive of course like I said extra weight also the fact that it takes away more um, from your drivetrain because there's a lot of parasitic drag on the drivetrain from an actual shaft drive. So you only lose about a percent to 3% of your power 
with a chain drive, mostly toward the percent mark from your flywheel to your actual rear wheel. So you lose less in a chain drive than you do any other system in terms of power output and all that stuff. So another good thing about it is it is a chain drive and it could put a lot of that power from the V-twin, that 125 horsepower to the back wheel, 120 to 125. Being that this is the rest replica, it has a little bit more fun and exciting things on there. Now just riding about today, and like I said, we're gonna be doing this like it is my own bike. So we're gonna be commuting, we're gonna be going to the store, we're gonna be trying to figure stuff out. I have a mission right now to go to Best Buy. I wanna go look at something, see if I can add something to the channel. I hate when people take both lanes and you can't really do anything around them and then they don't wanna get up to speed for an interstate. This is not how you get on an interstate. Of course, I'm in third gear, about 4,000 RPMs, doing about 40 miles an hour. Now I'm getting close to 5,000 RPMs at 50. Rip and roar, still in third gear. Get to 70, under 7,000 RPM. Bike has a red line all the way at nine. It don't care. <laughs> all right. So I'll go ahead and get the cruise control on and we're gonna set that up for our highway speed here. All right, so mirror visibility is actually rather good. I gotta get this worked out for me. I like these long mirrors, so it helps you see very nicely off these wide bars. Nice pro taper bars on this particular machine. This is not the rally, so it doesn't have the higher ones. This has the lower type bar. So seating position overall is more of an upright standard with a slight lean to the forward. You do have a little bit of lean, as you can see, from elbow down to the bar. And from your shoulder, you do have a little bit of a lean down to your elbow as well. On to the foot pegs. Foot pegs are basically right below my shoulder line where my feet are lying at right now. And also my knees and everything. You got the feet more toward the shoulder and the knees out forward to hold that. Now this bike is just absolutely fantastic for the open road like this and because it just has all the power in the world that you need. So you don't need to worry about what you got when you flip that throttle, if it's gonna go or not. This bike definitely wants to go. Has no issue with that at all. And the engine braking is super good on it. So you gotta be careful. I accidentally tap the uh, cruise control off instead of it. Um, setting it so it dropped off really quick there so you got to be careful but that's called just getting used to this new bike and feeling out where everything is ergonomically though everything is really good there's not much in the way to get to places so your turn signal is separate from the actual joystick that makes it easier to be able to tell it apart you can fill it out with your thumb of course your horn is there Everything is just kind of nice there. And there's only basically two things over here, which is your engine cutoff switch and also that forward paddle for your infotainment center or whatever you want to call it. All right. This thing is just a breeze to ride down the interstate right now. And right now we have some pretty decent winds today, somewhere around 20 something mile an hour in Oklahoma. One thing you can guarantee during the fall and during the spring is wind is constant and it will go one way or the other. Today, it is a north wind. Tomorrow, or actually later today, should be coming to a south wind. Tomorrow we'll be near 90 degrees. So I'll be able to check this thing out in hot temperatures. And that way I can give you a idea of how much heat comes off this machine on the longer course and also during some warmer temperatures. See right now it's only 79 degrees so it's not even that bad today. And actually winds looks like they're about to change because we got kind of a westerly flow right there so we might be in the middle of our change there. But nonetheless still get a good ride with getting buffeted by wind and everything. 
hitting these bigger bumps and some of the broken pavement that we have here in Oklahoma. Our lovely interstate highway system is not the best in the world. That is for dang sure. I'll never claim it to be. But my goodness gracious, does this bike ride really well. Of course, there's no wind protection or anything on this machine. It's just bare bones right in front of you. So I'm getting all that wind. And to be honest, it doesn't really toss the bike around. Bike is nice and planted. I will say that some of these rain grooves, I'll catch it and you'll feel the front tire due to the way the tread pattern and everything is. I'll feel it wander into those as, and uh, try to pull me a little bit here and there. But it's more on those big thicker ones that you can see that I'm between right now instead of the little ones. So if I get caught in one of those, I'll actually feel it try to try to guide me like I'm on a rail. That's something to note that I have not felt before on one of these just yet. But then again, I haven't been on this road up in this area with it just yet. So as you can see, everything's going rather well. We're 73 miles an hour in sixth gear and around 4200 to 4250 rpm in terms of what we're doing to hold a typical highway speed here in the u.s but as you can see the interstate not a big deal for this bike at all the added creature comfort of cruise control makes it nice these are a little bit smaller hand grips so my hands would start to try to cramp up on these pretty quickly for the fact that i'd have to grip onto them because they're very small for my hand size but when you're in cruise control, nice, easy. I kind of like that waffle pattern that they got. Now you can see you cancel the cruise control simply by rolling up on the throttle there. That does allow for cancellation. Look at that engine braking. I haven't even downshifted yet. Now that I am, see how much faster I'm going down. Doing a little rev match here and there. And this bike is just a nice, clean downshifting machine. And of course, you got those massive Brembo brakes up front that have an extremely good bite, extremely solid, solid bite. So pretty much on day one, it was business as usual, getting a good ride through the city, uh, through the interstates, getting a good idea and good feel for the bike. And that way we could get used to it once again, since it had been a while since I rode it. However, on day two, we had a little bit more fun. Let's do this the right way. Let's not have a vehicle in front of us that can't even stay between the lines. Let's get her in fifth gear so we got a little bit more power band. And let's have some fun with this bad boy. At least I get to see what the road condition was on the way in. So that way I know where we got and what we got going. And it's clean. Alrighty, so you can see this thing leans over very nicely. Has really good power in and out of the turn. Very good track in it as well. The suspension is not giving me any sort of uh, bobble or anything like that in the turn. It's extremely well planted. The bike wants to get down lower. Of course, I could probably get it a little bit down more, but I just don't want to ruin somebody else's machine. When I got a few blind turns and I got people like that that can't stay between the lines but I know this dadgum bike can handle this really nicely. Look at that deer down there, walking it through the water. <laughs> Another reason why you don't want to go that quick. You see this thing is just tearing this up. So much fun, man. So much usable power, so good lean angle. Woo! <laughs> Handles it quite nicely. That's an exciting amount of fun right there. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, that was this is by far the most fun bike I've ever had up through there. 
All right, so I know I was talking about a vehicle there. I'm not going to include them in there. It made the video very boring because they just got in the way and wouldn't get over 30 miles an hour through those turns, despite the fact that they're not very hard. And I do understand those are not very, very hard turns to get through when it comes to a motorcycle or anything like that. I just have to let you guys know Oklahoma really does have flat roads. I can handle these bikes on corners and everything, and they do very, very well in sweepers and everything. It's just very hard to find them here in Oklahoma. And this is about the closest thing we got. We have some other turns too that are a little bit sharper, uh, but they're not in succession. So let's go ahead and we'll jump over to those real quick. So now we get to play with the turns here. Like I said, I love the engine braking on this particular machine. The compression braking is very, very good. I don't know even pat or tapping anything right now. I'm gonna go ahead and dive in here. Ooh, it's fasty. <laughs> That made that turn easy. <laughs> that was a little too dang easy, sadly. <laughs> oh, man. And we'll go ahead and give her a little slowdown because it looks like there could be some gravel on it. There are some roads over here that are still dirt. Yeah, just a little bit on the outer edge, not bad. Man, this thing just tears right through those kind of turns, man. This thing just loves it. Making me love it. <laughs> this thing is just a lovely companion as a riding machine for dang sure, guys. Man, this is just what I love in a bike. A bike that you can simply do everything with and just enjoy the scenery and the just its abilities and, and the, just how lazy and easy going it is and yet how brutal at the same time this machine is. It has such amazing character and such stamina. Absolute peach. It just handles those turns so effortlessly. You know, I'm used to wrestling a motorcycle through those turns. I'm used to coming up at those turns at a much slower clip too, and wrestling the whole thing in there, dragging components or going slow enough that it doesn't matter. And this bike just eclipses everything I've brought up here so far in terms of lean angle and speed and ability to do all that. Quite a phenomenal machine. And yes, I get it, those turns really are not that complicated, but it's amazing when you go from something that only has a 31 degree lean angle and turn to something that has such a greater amount. And the fact that, you know, like I said, the steering is so light, you're not wrestling this machine at all. You literally just press the direction you want to go into and the bike just sticks and goes. It's just amazing. I love it. I love the stickiness of this machine. Once again, we get another chance at this. And I just look forward to every single one I get because man, oh man. Like I said, you just press into this thing. I'm not even using regular braking or anything. I'm just going in, getting a good lean in, getting a good press, getting a wave in the middle of that mess somehow. <laughs> and just blasting through the turn. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. This bike is just so effortless. I'd even, I even waved. <laughs> I'm so used to just trying to wrestle the thing down. I was able to wave. <laughs> I don't think he did. Alrighty. Man. 
just unbelievably well done chassis on this thing. It turns. It's just so good at it. It's just everything is so good on this machine. It, it just blows most of the bikes I've been on out of the water. You just get a very nice, pleasant feeling when you ride this machine. You really do. I feel at home already. <laughs> I haven't had very much time with it at all, and I just already feel so much at home. Just some tweaks here and there. Just some getting to know this machine a little bit more is all it really will take to get this thing dialed in and perfect for me. And, and I will be so, so much happy. And I, I mean, what can you say? When you find a bike that just sings to you like this, this is the bike that you need. It's a bike that if you go back and look at it as you get off of it and you're able to look back at it and just and still be in love with it, you know it's the, it's the right bike for you. And this bike, honestly, even though it's not mine, I really do wish it was mine. And I probably will try my darndest to get one of these somehow in some way. So this ride ended up going over two hours in length, basically draining the fuel tank uh, completely. And that way it gave me a good chance to ride it and get the seat down and everything of that nature. The seating position was really, really good on this machine for me. I will say that the seat for the rider does need a little bit of work. It's about as good as a full tank of gas and then you really do need to stretch out. But overall for a long tripper, not too bad. Now one thing about it, if you're gonna be using a bike every day, you definitely wanna know how it is at night. Let's take a look at that real fast. All right, everybody, time for the night ride. Everybody always needs to know a bike that they're going to use for everyday purposes. What is it like at night? You can see the LED Pathfinder headlight. You can see the LED tail light. Plate mount light. Very bright indeed. What about these turn signals? Nice and shiny. It's always good to take a look to see how visible you really will be at night because part of that safety at night is visibility. You can see now the gauge cluster has actually turned on to a night mode now. Giving it that blacked out look. All right. Good gracious, this thing has brought us all that cat like right there and then, wow. <laughs> kind of an interesting half moon shape light coming off this thing. I feel almost bad for these poor people I'm about to turn into. I'm not even on bright yet, good night. <laughs> well, yeah, good night. <laughs> But that's the thing, riding at night is a thing. You guys have to be able to see and have to have that safety. You don't want to override the headlight. You want your headlight to be able to get beyond, you know, only a couple of seconds in front of you. I actually had an issue with my night run when I first got it, that the headlight really could be overrode very quickly. And that was a very bad day most of the time. Basically only had mere, mere feet in front of you until we got it adjusted finally. And I basically had to push it all the way to the top of the, adjustment area basically and it really was very hard to see all right here we go time for the uh time for the thing oh <laughs> would you look at that kind of action look at that side to side i'm in deer country up here 
I appreciate that kind of distancing. Wow. Let's go to where there's nothing to get in the way. Let's go to the direction where there's less traffic lights, less man-made light on the horizon. Look at this thing. I mean, even in the standard normal light beam, you can see side to side super well. I'm very appreciative of that. And you maybe have about six seconds of headlight distance ahead of you, which is a good thing. You want to have about four seconds to six seconds of, you know, forward visibility. But of course your maximum that you want to see is 12 seconds. And that's something that is awful hard to do at night. You have traffic coming at you. You have cars that are heading away from you. And I'm actually too close because I can see those two tail lights right there. So if I turn this on, I'm going to blast his poor rear view mirror. Now that I'm on the bottom of this hill, though, it looks like he's turning. Good gracious, look at that. I think the wife scout's going to have to get itself a little upgrade. And hey, we're going to be talking about some speed too, because let's be honest here. If you want, if you outride your light, what good is your light? So away we go. Actually saw that debris just fine. Rocketing away. And I have to say, even at highway speeds, the light is good. I am very, very impressed with the lighting on this machine. We have come a long way in technology and lighting. And uh, my goodness gracious, good job, Indian, and your Pathfinder light for that distancing. I mean, I didn't even need to hit the brights or anything. And I could still see, you can see 75 mile an hour is our speed limit. And I'm riding about four seconds behind that vehicle in front of me, four to five seconds. And because um, I'm counting it out from these markers here. And it shines right up to the back bumper of that car, if not a little bit beyond it. Meaning I can see that far at 75, 76, 77 miles an hour without an issue. And that's definitely a great thing whenever you're going at highway speeds at night, you wanna be able to see that. And like I said, that side to side, I'm in deer country up here and they will run out on the interstate at this time of night, at this time of year. This is October 1. This is for Oklahoma, the beginning of deer season. So there's gonna be some deer on the move up here and they will run out into the interstate. They don't give a flying flip up here. And they will cut you down. So being able to see over to the other side, I can actually see clear to that other shoulder on the other side of the interstate here. And I could see clear up that ramp, clear up into those trees right now at this speed. So you have extremely good visibility from the back of this machine. The headlights are going well. The rest of the brightness and everything, I like the way that they are portrayed. I like the brightness of that rear LED light. Of course, when you kick on the brake, it's a lot brighter. I didn't do that, unfortunately, because it's kind of hard to show you video. <laughs> but man, oh man, I tell you what, I need, I need this headlight on my bike. Definitely need to put it on the Scout. That is for dang sure. Bye bye, buddy. See, I'm not doing anything wrong. So at any rate, <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the night portion of this review because uh, I definitely did. <laughs> definitely seeing quite a bit in the middle of the night. And what do you know, it's lovely. So this is definitely one of the best stock lights I have ever seen at night. And I was very impressed with it. One of the longest reaching headlights I've ever used. 
So at any rate, we're going to actually add a passenger because what everyday use would be with passenger pegs and seat if you don't actually use them. So let's go ahead and let's start the passenger portion of this review. What's up, everybody? Rabbit Hedgehog and poor guinea pig wife. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> On the FTR as a passenger. Now, of course, as you can see, it's a regular old Sunday afternoon. It's lunchtime. Maybe a little after lunchtime, but we just got done eating. And, uh... We already have some thoughts about the seat on this thing uh, for a passenger, and, and they're not they're not happy. No, they're not happy. So, uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, you got about a 12 mile ride to uh, get those thoughts re back in your head. Yay! <laughs> I'm so looking forward to that. I bet you are. Well, first you got to climb Mount Everest. Yeah. Okay. That's my head. Sorry. I'm trying to get on this thing. I'm only, you know, 5'2", so it's very, very tall seat height for me. All righty. Well. Anyway. Back to moving about here. All right. So here we are leaving lunch, heading back for the Casa. And you found it more comfortable to be sitting on the sidewalk than you did sitting on this thing right now? Yes. Well, that's a bummer. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, this seat, there's like, first off, it's very small. I'm not a very big person and I'm almost hanging off of it. And there's like no padding. And yeah, the sidewalk was a bit more comfortable. Well, that's interesting. So I guess you're going to have to write your chiropractor after you're done writing this thing, huh? Yes. Oh, there you go. But what about the suspension on it? Whenever you're riding on it, I know you're kind of out there and the suspension travel is offset and kind of under the rider again. How does it feel back there on the tail section? Uh, for now, it's okay, but we're not really hitting any bumps, so. Well, when we were hitting bumps on the way in, how'd that feel? That... Some were worse than others. I mean, it wasn't completely terrible, but there were some that were pretty bad. So what you're saying is I need to work on the rebound uh, and stuff on the bike a little bit more. Yeah. Well, at least it's adjustable. There's some that you can't get that out of there, probably. True. So if I had time, I would be able to adjust it probably to fix that issue, but the seat, the seat is something I can't just fix very easily. No. <laughs> but the thing is, when it comes down to riding this machine just as a rider with a passenger, yeah, it's a little cramped accommodations because it's not a very big motorcycle. So, yes, the passenger's back there, and I do have to lean a little bit more forward to accommodate the passenger on the back seat. So you get a little bit more lean into your wrists, a little bit more weight on them when you're riding. Now, the bike itself doesn't actually care that she's there. It's not really acting like that there's a passenger in any way, shape, or form in terms of how we're riding right now. I don't have any issue with the bike tracking or anything like that. It's The added weight isn't making it squirrely. It's not causing any weird motions. The wind isn't picking us up any differently. We can ride into the wind and around the wind with the wind to our side, and it's not really blowing us around at all. The bike is still very well planted and still holding its own. So that's a good thing as a rider if you're going to be using this for a passenger machine that it's still very stable and as in terms of the rider comfort it's still pretty comfortable in the suspension i don't feel the bouncing that she does back there i just feel the motorcycle handling it a little bit differently but you know acceleration everything is still there the bike is still exciting the braking is hilarious still yeah causes passenger to become one with the rider. <laughs> so it very much well, you better be close together or very, very friendly with each other to uh, to ride this machine because you're going to be very close the whole time and you're going to get closer if you have to break. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not really that bad to me at all. 
It's just that if you're going to use this bike for a long ride, I would not recommend having a passenger on it because eventually no. the, the passenger is going to say no, first off. You heard that immediately. Second off, as a rider, eventually the extra weight that you have on your own wrist and stuff will start to weigh in on you. So you're going to get a little bit more tired and of course in a more cramped position because you don't have as much room to move back and forth. The seat's very generous if you're solo, but if you're not, then you can't really move back and forth. So you're pretty locked into a position that eventually you'll get tired of in a moment's notice. So you'll probably only last with a passenger 45 minutes at best as a rider. And that's just from the extra weight and the different position that you're in. Because you can't move your hip out and stuff. At least I can't. And so that that's the only difference here. But in a pinch, the FTR works for a passenger. In a pinch. No more than a pinch. All right. With the all-important passenger perspective out of the way, we want to talk about fueling and the fuel economy of the FTR because it is a little bit unique. Morning, everybody. Let's go take this thing over to a gas station real quick, like, because she's very unhappy right now. Luckily, the gas stations aren't too terribly far away from the house. Now, here's the thing about the FTR. You'll see that it is about 60 degrees right now. It's 59. And with that being said, when you start one of these up cold, they do not like it. They are a higher performance engine and higher performance engines do not like being cold whatsoever. And in many cases, it might trigger a misfire condition while it's warming up. It may stall the engine while it's warming up. So it may get angry while it's warming up. Now the thing is, part of that is because of how they have to handle emissions and they have to basically lean this thing out to a point that it doesn't help its life. So it gets angry. So you can actually tune that out or change the ECU out and do some tuning on it and allow it to no longer be an issue. But out of the factory, these bikes are a little bit cranky. But you know, the thing is, once they warm up, and what I'll do is I'll start it up and get it warmed up like I did here to about 110 to 100 and, you know, 20 degrees on the temperature there, and it is not unhappy at all. Well, you forget how fast this thing gets up to speed. Now, running in, in, in running order right now, like we're doing in this temperature, this is a very happy temperature for it. It really likes running around in cooler weather without a big deal going on. It simply doesn't like starting in it. So now comes the fun part with FTRs is the fueling process is actually kind of slow. And that's something I had to learn because the first time I did it, I didn't get the bike all the way full. The, the second time I figured it out. So this is the third time I'm coming in for a drink. So let's go ahead and drop off in here and get ourselves some premium no ethanol gasoline here. All right, so the FTR's tank is actually under the seat, but the filling port is right there. You can see it goes down and away. Put that there. And we're gonna go down into that real quick. And we were gonna begin the fueling process. Now the tank on this is incredibly large. You can see it's actually cooler this morning. You can actually see some steam coming off the gasoline because it's hot from being underground. <laughs> it's kind of funny. All right, so we're going to get to a point and it's going to splash up from the bottom end and act like it's full. There it is right there. So there's the splash up. Stop feeling for a moment. 
and give it a little shake there and there it goes right back down again. Continue. It's when it doesn't go back down is when it's actually full. That's the trick. All right, wait for it. Back down it goes, continue. Just shaking it to get a feel for where it's at. We're still not there yet. Now I've tested this. And if it doesn't go back down, it doesn't come out the, res or the uh, bottom either off the overflows, which means we're still not full yet until we get about there. All right, so see it's right at the bottom of the neck there. And now we've got a full tank of fuel. Now it turned on the light with 2.865-ish gallons. I can't tell if that's a four or five because it broke out there. But nonetheless, let's see, do, do 2.864. So 2.864 gallons is what it took on board. And we actually got it full. I'm gonna go ahead and get that going there. All right, so for the first time I did fuel economy, it wasn't a good number because I didn't get the tank all the way full. And we have 111.7 on there. And then we had the 2.864. Right around 39 miles per gallon is what we got off that. The first time I did it, I got like 32 or 30 or somewhere in there, which is terrible for a motorcycle. It reminded me of my night rod, which is a terrible, terrible feeling for a motorcycle. So I had to say that that wasn't the best, but then I realized I don't think I got it all the way full. So when I refilled it, I figured out I didn't. And now we're getting about 39 to 40 miles per gallon out of the FTR. So getting a lot better distance than I originally thought you could, because a lot of people said it was pretty limited to around 100, and of course I filled it 111. I could get about the same distance out of this bike as you can a conventional Indian Scout. So there you have it. Filling the FTR, you just have to be patient while you're filling it and wait until you get a certain point and then you have absolutely filled the tank. And that means you're good to go. So happiness can ensue once again for a hundred and some miles. So at any rate, I hope that tutorial on how to fill your FTR properly helps out and seeing the actual fuel economy uh, between mixed riding that was not um, just highway or anything like that. That's between city and highway and stop and go and revving for kids and having fun with this bike. Got 39 miles per gallon. And like I said, I have, a, I have witnessed around 40 something when I redid my calculation from when I knew I didn't get the tank completely filled up and figured out how much extra that is after that first splash and kind of computed it to get about 42. And that one was more steady highway. There was a little bit of stop and go in there, not as much. This one had a lot more stop and go because I used it for the week at work. So this was all one week of riding. Whoa, buddy boy. You all right? Where's your owners at, buddy? Anyway, um, so it was all basically one week's worth of actually riding to and from work, going down, getting in stop and go traffic, dealing with construction traffic, literally everything you would do if you own this machine happened this week. And it worked out very well, 39 to the gallon. So as you can see, we did put the FTR through its paces. Lots of city riding, which I was going to put a lot of video in there, but it's boring. So we didn't put that in there. Uh, lots of interstate that's between the house and the job and everything like that. So we put it through its paces, put 
over 300 miles on this machine before the end of uh, the time that I had with it. And on this particular day here, we reached into the middle 90s in temperature, and we got a good feel for how the engine heat and everything came off of the machine, and it really wasn't that bad at all. So let's go ahead and get to the conclusion of this video and do the final wrap up of what I think of the FTR 1200. Well, everyone, this is gonna be a very sad, sad day in Mr. Hedgehog's life here. The day I gotta take back this lovely machine to Indian of Oklahoma City. I got to spend the entire week with it, put on a couple hundred miles, basically 300-ish, <laughs> gave it a good weekly haul, like it was a commuter bike of my own. Because I do use my bikes for everything. I do try to use them for utility purposes and just about everything. Right now, of course, I'm carrying a backpack with extra equipment and everything right now. And so a little bit different setup for me even, but using this bike one more time as I go down to Indian OKC to return it. But I wanted to make a conclusion on this motorcycle from the back of this motorcycle. So is it a perfect motorcycle? No, there's really not a perfect motorcycle out there. There's good motorcycles, there's great motorcycles, and there's just terrible motorcycles. And this one definitely actually to me is one of the greats. Does it have some ho-hums? Yes, it does. It does have the cold start fun problem that it has. But just remember, just start it up and let it idle up a little bit and get up to about 100 degrees, 110 degrees, and it's totally fine. Does it have a seat that doesn't last as long as it needs to for a bike this fun? Yeah. I mean, it's got a good seat for between gas station stops, but other than that, eh, it's not nothing to write home about. And does it have a good passenger accommodation? Absolutely not. <laughs> but for what you get on this machine, you get a lot of motorcycle. It reminds me of going back to my night rod days when I had that thing, and that was the sportiest of Harleys, and yet it didn't match what it was supposed to. The pegs were forward mounted, the seating position was more of a clamshell. It just didn't fit right with the motif of it being a sporting bike with the power and everything that it had, the 240 rear end. This one just makes it better, and I know the night rod is more of that dragster for the street, and this is more the flat tracker for the street. But they come in at similar horsepower. They come in at similar prices from back in the day. In fact, if you think about it with inflation, the night rod was more because it started around 17.2, and this bike here starts are in this basically 14.15s range up to around 17, depending on your trim levels. So you get kind of a wide range of trim levels with this bike, whereas the night rod you had it and the V-Rod Muscle, and both of them were very expensive. Both of them lacked traction control. Both of them lacked modes. Both of them lacked even uh, electronic, you know, throttle position or anything. Both of them lack cruise control. None of them have the features this bike does for the cost. None of them had fully adjustable shocks. This one has fully adjustable shocks front and rear. Of course, it does benefit from modern technology, the 4.3 inch ride command screen, which is fantastic and easy to use and fun to use on the fly. You know, you could just go through and connect your phone and make it your hub, you know, for your communicator and everything. And it just works out so seamlessly. It makes it that modern motorcycle for the modern rider where people are always connected and it allows you to do that. It's things that Night Raw just never had a chance to be. It's things that I wish Harley would have decided upon to make the Night Rod a more modern machine and come after this one. Now, does this bike work off-road as well? Kind of a ho-hum? Not really, because the fact that the uh, position of the pegs are more angled down. 
they're not straight down from you. If you're gonna be on the off-road portions, you definitely want pegs to be straight down. So when you stand up, you are leaning kind of forward onto the front. And that's not really what this bike is about though. As I've rode this machine, I've made note that this is probably one of the finest street machines and one of the best street fighters, if you want to call it that, there is. It goes against the monster. It goes against several of those other machines from Europe. And to me, this one just has soul and character that is amazing for its price point and does very, very well and rides extremely well. It is an absolutely fantastic machine overall. Is its fuel range short? Yes, but so are others. Does it get over 100 miles to a tank? Yes, it does actually. And I've been actually getting around 40 miles per gallon. So that's not bad at all for a machine in this class. Back going to the night rod once again, that bike barely, barely made 33 most of the time. With only like one time did it ever experience 40 miles per gallon. And that took a bunch of effort to like hyper mile a motorcycle to get to the said 40 miles per gallon. This bike does it without doing such a thing. This bike just rides really well. It takes a little bit of time to fill it up, but once you get it filled up, you're good to go for over 100 miles, almost 130 when you take all into consideration. So it means it has just about as much traveling distance as a standard Scout. About 130 or so miles. So that's not bad at all for a machine like this. This bike is not just a point A to point B bike. This bike for a rider is a very comfortable machine. It allows you to go out and enjoy the roads out and around your city. It allows you to go out and canyon carve. Yes, you'll need to fill up a little bit more often and yes, you'll need to stretch a little bit here and there without an additional seat, but it's, it's okay. This bike literally has been my best friend and I very comfortably set into it and got going into it so quickly this week because it's such a forgiving and easy machine to ride. It has a bunch of power, but it's not so overwhelming that it's gonna throw you off, new rider or old. You can honestly change it to rain mode if you don't wanna fill the full power. You can keep it out of track mode. You can keep traction control and ABS on. You can keep wheelie mitigation on. You can do all that stuff if you don't feel like you're comfortable with controlling a motorcycle like this. It allows for that. It allows for that fine balance between being a bike you can grow into and being a bike for experts because this bike is phenomenal at turning. This bike is phenomenal at holding its weight. This bike is phenomenal at balance. It's real easy to center line this bike from the stand. And it's real easy to propel this bike through the streets. It's literally like it's thinking for you. And it's very, very nice. The suspension is wonderful. Yes, 5.9 inches of travel. And that's another reason why it's not the best of the best going off road because the suspension is short for it, but for a road, turning it to where you need it to be and it's a very easy adjustment on each side is phenomenal. It just goes over the roads really, really well. You can make it as sporting and as tough as you want or you can make it soft and cuddly. And that is so weird to be able to do something like that with a machine with this caliber performance. The engine has been a peach the whole time. The cooling system has been a peach the whole time. Cooling, as you'll see, we're at 173 degrees, 68 degrees right now. I've been out on days where it's 90 degrees and the heat isn't even that bad coming off of this machine. Like I said, I may be just a little bit more tolerant to heat than others because I ride a lot of air-cooled bikes. But when it comes down to it, this bike is phenomenal in terms of its cooling system because you'll see this thing get up to 206, turn its fans on, drop to 190s in less than three minutes. And when you're moving, it just goes down and settles into the 170s and stays there as long as you got movement and airflow. And that is a fantastic cooling system. The night rod I remember was so much hotter than this bike. There was always a constant baking to my right inner thigh. There was always something burning me somewhere. I'd sit still and my fans would kick on. And when those fans would kick on, the poor people to the right or left of me, if they were in the right position, would suddenly feel a burst of heat they could not explain. And it was just from that bike kicking it out. 
This one does send a burst of heat, but it's so short lived, it doesn't really bother you as a rider. But that's only when you're sitting still and the bike has a chance to heat up while sitting still. But it takes a bunch to do that. So that's actually really good. This bike just likes to be in a little bit warmer condition. Like I said, it does have a little bit of a misfire and a little bit of issue on that every once in a while when it's cold, cold, but just warm it up, give the bike a chance, and that way it will, will treat you well. Because when this bike is up to temperature and this bike is going down the road, you do not have any problems whatsoever. It's a very smooth running engine. The engine is very powerful. It works well in all the power bands. It does well in sport mode and tour mode. So it does well throughout its or standard mode, excuse me. It does well in its sport and standard mode. It does very well in all conditions that I've put it through this week. Even a little bit of rain was falling and I kept it in sport mode to be honest because the throttle is so easy to work with even in sport mode, even in a little bit twitchier mode. Easy modulation, one-to-one -one feeling, everything is good. If you're a good rider and you've been riding a long time, this bike will treat you very, very well. But if you're a new rider, like I said, turn the power modes down a little bit if you need to until you get that good one-to-one -one feel for yourself and it will treat you well to grow into. The seating position is good for me. I really do enjoy the way it sits. It does have that little bit of arc forward to the you know front for me. It is a little bit more aggressive than your standard motorcycle, but it works out very well. It doesn't put much weight on the wrist at all. If you do have a passenger, yes, they do scoot into you and it does cause a little bit more weight to those wrists. So you do have a little bit more to deal with if you do carry a passenger. But overall, this is a great motorcycle. This, this really is gonna be sad. I've grown so accustomed to this thing and so happy with it, you know? It's just been such a great ride for these last few days. And no, I'm not paid by Indian. No, I'm not paid by the dealership. I'm not paid by anybody to do this. I just wanted to take a long-term bike ride out and be able to get actual feedback for a whole entire week of riding so that way I can get that to you guys. That way I could have you guys see what it's like to ride a machine for an entire week, put several hundred miles on it, and not just a 10 minute ride or 20 minute ride. And I have to say this has been a great experience and I'm very thankful to Indian of Oklahoma City for allowing me the first experience in doing this. I truly hope that I can catch more people to allow me to do this and more motorcycle manufacturers to allow this. So that way you guys can get the idea of how these bikes are as an owner. And I really have felt like an owner of this machine. I've put gas in it. I've done everything I needed to for it. And it's been fantastic. And I will dearly, dearly miss this machine. So at any rate, thanks for coming along for the ride. This is the Rabbit Hedgehog. And as always, keep that shiny side up and we'll catch you on the next ride. What's up, everybody? This is the Rabbit Hedgehog. We once again want to thank you for watching our videos. Please like, share, subscribe today. And if you like what you see, mash that notification button so that way you get our latest videos and notifications live and on the spot. We also want to thank our dealership partners, Indian of Oklahoma City, House of Kawasaki, and Motive Cycle Works Moto Guzzi, who is also our motorcycle mechanic. We want to thank them for allowing us to ride their rides. We are not paid in by any way by any manufacturer or dealer. We just get to be mad men and women with opinions. We also want to reach out to our sponsors and thank them. We have Law Tigers Motorcycle Lawyers. These motorcycle lawyers are mostly nationwide and can be reached 24-7 at lawtigers.com or 1-888-888. 868-0208. We also want to thank our newest sponsor for gear and the things that you see us wearing, AGV Sport USA. They are out of agvsportusa.com in Flower Mound, Texas. We also want to thank Doug Crawford and AMS Oil for protecting our machines with the latest in lubrication technologies. He can be found at usasynthetics.com or 405-388-6170. And also for Derek Inlow and Associates Insurance Company, he can be found at 405-261-1010. Once again, everybody keep that shiny side up and we'll catch you on the next ride.